Hi everyone, I'm Andrei Zolotov. I'm a software engineer at MasterCard. And uh, I'm Gideon Lowe. I'm a principal architect for the data transformation team at Pivotal. I work on the MasterCard's decision management platform. Today, I'm going to talk about several challenges we've had to overcome to keep up with the growth of the platform. You learn several design patterns that enable scaling the data volume and transaction throughput uh, of data-hungry application without sacrificing latency. What is the decision management platform? It's MasterCard's multi-purpose transaction processing engine based on a plugin architecture. We provide a framework and supporting services that are used to implement over 20 MasterCard products. Anytime you swipe or tap with a MasterCard, your transaction goes through uh, our platform before it's approved. The platform is able to support over 60,000 financial transactions per second with average response times of under 100 milliseconds. You achieve this by parallel processing on hundreds of commodity servers. The platform uses transaction features enriched with historical and real-time aggregates to execute several risk models and hundreds of decision rules. It calculates hundreds of variables in real time and consumes even more offline generated features to evaluate the risk of each transaction. DMP has the ability to block and alert on risky transactions to protect from fraud losses. It runs products that protect the issuers, merchants, um, acquirers, and the cardholders. To determine transaction risk in real time, our system needs to be extremely quick. We constantly work on minimizing the response times of each transaction to be able to have necessary resources for the required volume. We try to keep the average transaction latency at around 50 milliseconds uh, to have plenty of room to respond uh, in, any, in case any unexpected slowdowns occur. Scaling the services is a fairly well-known problem, but scaling the data is the real challenge. So DMP uses tens of billions of aggregates that get updated and consumed in real time for each transaction. Having many terabytes of shareable data available to the instances is necessary for effective and scalable decisioning platform. Our data requirement is sub-millisecond reads at scale, which means maintaining these latencies uh, at several million reads per second. We also have a unique requirement of atomically applying small changes to large entries uh, hundreds of thousands of times per second. This can only be achieved with efficient contention management. With uh, hundreds of reads and writes per transaction, we can't go to disk, so the data needs to be in memory. So after a long search for a distributed in-memory data store, DMP team chose Geode as the data solution for our real-time scoring engine. Geode is a low latency, in-memory distributed key value data grid. So problem solved, right? Not exactly. Distributed in-memory data store is a great tool to share data and state for your application. And it's even more useful as a distributed compute engine. However, there are many caveats of using distributed data system, especially for real-time processing. The most important ones are data access scalability, even data distribution, concurrent operations, and latency consistency. All of these have to be addressed to achieve large scale. Before we take a look at each one, let's see how Geode distributes the data across a cluster. Okay. So here's a quick primer on uh, Geode partitioning. Like most scalable data management solutions, Geode begins with a pool of hardware resources, upon which it runs its server processes. For each partition data set, a fixed number of bucket partitions must be defined. 
And then Geode takes care of striping these buckets evenly across the available pool of servers. Geode colocation groups together data entries so that they always reside in the same server process. This is accomplished by making sure that every entry in a logical group is mapped to the same bucket. The key takeaway is that while logical grouping is assured, the allocation of groups to buckets and of buckets to servers is more transparent to developers and operations. Developers generally only need to interact with the data at a logical level. At every layer, there are choices that lead to an optimally performing system. For example, the hardware pool must be large enough and have an appropriate ratio of compute, memory, and network capacity to handle the targeted use cases. In very large deployments, the geode and hardware server pool sizes are typically the same. So that part is easy. Let's zoom in on the mechanics of geode partitioning. The mapping of any given data entry to a specific bucket is always consistent. First, the key is used to extract a hash code. For default partitioning, geode simply uses the hash code method on the key. For custom partitioning, we use some attribute of the key, and then we take a hash code on that attribute. Um, and that's impl implemented via partition resolver interface or configured via string prefix partition resolver uh, in cases where the string is a data structure with the group ID embedded. Then we apply the modulus arithmetic operator to the hash code using the fixed bucket count. The allocation of buckets to cache server processes is dynamic. Internally, Geode maintains and distributes a map of buckets to servers, the partitioning metadata. And this is used to optimize data-specific um, request routing. For example, any CRUD or read operation on a partition region entry, or as we'll discuss later, data-aware function execution. For the most advanced use cases, such as MasterCard's transaction processing and decision management platform, the size of the partition region bucket pool and the choice of data colocation or grouping can make a big difference. Back to Andre for a deep dive into some of the partition data specific optimizations. For scalability of data access, related data should be collocated whenever possible. That means if you have different types of data for the same account, it should all live on the same node. This way, the client would only need to send requests to a single node to access all the data for that account. Let's assume we have 100 transaction entries for a particular user account. We're storing these entries on a six node cluster. Although the code looks like it would only send one get all request, in reality, the request will go out to up to six nodes to retrieve the entries. What's worse, is that when you expand to a 50 node cluster, your client may have to contact up to 50 nodes to get all 100 entries. That's not scalable or performant. It's bad for the client resources, bad for the data nodes, and bad for the network. This issue can be solved by collocating your data. We implement partition resolver on child key classes that return partial key for geo to use to determine the bucket. In this example, the combo key contains the user ID and the transaction ID. We return only the user ID with the partition resolver, uh, and the transaction data will be collocated with its user. This way, all of the transactions for a single account can be retrieved on a, in a single call to one data node. In conclusion, Data collocation is one of the most important things to implement for cluster scalability when performing multiple operations in parallel. Implementing collocation allowed us to read hundreds of entries per transaction, reaching over 8 million reads per second. It also allowed us to scale the cluster horizontally without increasing the number of network calls. The next challenge is even data distribution. It's important to make sure that, the, that keys 
uh, distribute evenly. Otherwise, your cluster is not scalable. If a disproportionate amount um, of data somehow ends up in a single bucket, your workload will be unbalanced. Rebalancing may help a bit, uh, but it's always better to ensure that you do not end up with uneven buckets. Choosing the number of buckets is also important for scalability and should be done before going to production. Number of buckets cannot be changed with live data. So number of buckets should also be a prime number to ensure the best distribution of keys, especially for numeric keys that are incremented by a number other than one. It took us months to come up to a consensus on the number of buckets. Choosing the number of buckets is somewhat confusing, but it doesn't have to be. Geode's default is 113, but that's too small uh, for larger clusters. We can use my formula to easily estimate the number of required buckets. It takes just four variables. We need to know the maximum number of expected nodes to minimize bucket imbalance. Let's say 12 nodes for this example. A maximum of 5% difference between the nodes uh, sounds pretty good. Let's say the data is estimated uh, to use a maximum of uh, 500 gigabytes. The size of each bucket also matters. We don't want to have extremely large buckets uh, sent over the network during your balancing. Let's limit that to 500 megs. Solving the fractions, we get 240 and 1024, so we choose the larger number, and then the next prime, prime number above that. We get 1031. If both of those values came out under 113, we would just use Gemfire's default. With this formula, choosing the number of buckets is much easier than guessing and hoping for the best. Another challenge is our large data set. While transaction volume could grow up to 25% per year, data consumption and aggregation needs more than double year over year as data scientists and rule authors devise more complicated models for, rule per, uh, for fraud protection. As data size grew, we needed to add more capacity. As we scaled data clusters, we realized that too many nodes was not optimal for performance as there was too much network chatter. Also, having large data sets created unwanted GC pauses. Okay, so before Andre dives into how DMP analyzed and solved their Java GC challenges, I'd like to briefly discuss how Geode helps to optimize memory and garbage collection, and how this affects different workload patterns as server heap sizes grow. Now, I've been involved with Gemfire and Geode for, since the earliest days, and um, over the years, competing Java caching products have told customers that you cannot have large Java heaps without incurring crippling GC pauses. This is something of kind of, as I introduced many of, of today's Geode users to, to, uh, to the product for the first time, that's a feedback I often got. That it's impossible to have you know, low GC pause times when you have you know, these large heaps. First, that was a eight gigabyte heap, too big, right? <laughs> Even that. Um, and yet these days, there are many Geode production systems with server heap sizes in the hundreds of gigabytes. There's several factors that enable large-scale geode servers with reasonable pause times. Um, so let's assume, right, we have the basics covered um, and the obvious pitfalls. We're not swapping memory to disk. There's no system.gc calls. We don't have wildly different object sizes fragmenting the heap. Um, we've given it enough headroom and, and sized our generations right, okay? So here's some geode factors that really help to support these larger heap sizes. Um, one is that we do a great job minimizing the impact of short-lived objects. And we do this via our thread model and method inlining. Um, so when a thread takes a request from a client, 
it actually takes that request and does all the work and then returns a response on that same thread. That allows uh, Java's escape analysis to recognize that object allocations in that thread don't need to escape that thread of execution. And they don't get allocated on the heap, they get allocated on the, Java, on the stack instead. In those cases, there's no GC impact. Um, so that's one thing important. Another is that um, we use byte array storage for data as our first option. And that reduces the complexity of the Java object graph. I'll go into that a bit more and provides a number of different efficiencies. So, you know, what, what is the impact of byte array storage on server-side data? Um, in fact, it really is a huge optimization. Um, it is the default storage model, and um, it's most efficient when there's no server-side code. So, without any server-side custom code, Gemfire servers are actually these amazingly efficient byte array managers. Um, and uh, you can scale them very easily to very high rates and large data because um, there's a very, what's happening in the Java heap is actually quite simple compared to, to other cases. So in those cases, clients can really read and write data at high rates with maximum efficiency. Um, and uh, it greatly eases the GC workload since most of the heap is filled with the simplest possible object type, a, a byte array. Um, and each one of those is a final leaf node in the overall um, in-memory Java object graph. And we actually greatly ease I.O. overhead because data is already in on-the-wire format. Um, it's also on the on-disk format. I mean, what could be better for interacting with input streams and output streams than byte arrays? <laughs> However, if you add custom server-side logic that interacts with the data, then you've broken that minimum overhead state um, as code usually deserializes data to interact with it. So you either have to deserialize on demand um, or you have to deserialize eagerly when you get the data. Um, and and uh, both of those are expensive and they both increase the overall object count in the graph and, and just the, the, the garbage collector has more work to do. And it also, if the, you store deserialized, it increases the amount of memory that it takes to, to store the data. So, you know, what, what is the worst case scenario for, for large heap Java? Um, think about these, these factors, right? It might look like this. Um, one thing that would be tough is a lot of different object sizes, right? Memory fragmentation. Um, which you know, causes the concurrent mark sweep to have to defrag. Uh, that's a big stop the world pause, for example, or cause allocation failure in G1. It's a factor in all garbage collectors, um, all the, 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 uh, the ones that use spaces. A high cached object churn rate is also very tough, right? It causes high pressure on all the generations and, and more GC workload. Even worse is if every operation, or most of them, read, the, read, modify, and write all in one, and you're deserializing, you're changing, you're reserializing, you're sending it out, it uh, increases the work that has to be done. So is the size of the heap a factor? No. <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb. It's not. Not directly, anyway. This is a misconception. Large heap sizes don't have an inherent disadvantage. It's the size and complexity of the overall object graph that has the largest impact. Remember that the non-concurrent marking phase, pause time, in, in concurrent mark sweep grows as O to the N. It's a linear increase with the number of objects, not the amount of memory. Um, and then complexity, right? The more references you have, to manage, especially as objects are promoted through generations, the more work the garbage collector has to do during non-concurrent phase, during the, the pause phases. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so really, if you add logic execution on the server, and then you have to either store data, serialize and deserialize on demand, or store it as POJOs and increase that complexity, you've kind of gotten to the state where if you add all these things together, 
That's probably the worst case scenario. Um, and on top of that, you need aggressive low latency and low jitter. Uh, this is exactly the use case that MasterCard has encountered. And so let's see how they analyzed and solved this problem. So we can scale horizontally to some extent until running into issues. We can also scale vertically by adding more M to each node. But then we start experiencing unwanted garbage collection pauses. During our research, we found a few viable solutions that would allow us to scale using LRU overflow, geodes off heap storage, or using a pauseless JVM. Let's take a look how different configurations compare. Here we have a uh, we relative evaluations of each option. This applies to our use case, but results may vary depending on the cluster workload. We start out with vanilla configuration and large heaps. Unfortunately, out-of-the-box settings could not work for our workload, as GC pauses get too high for low latency applications. Long JVM pauses could cause the nodes to be evicted from the cluster on the first garbage collection. This makes the cluster very unreliable and response times completely unpredictable. The next idea is to have a large number of smaller nodes. When we scaled horizontally, eventually the system didn't do too well with a large number of client uh, and peer-to-peer -peer connections. A large number of connections is not good for the system and network resources, so you could count on the cluster being unstable. First viable option was to use asynchronous persistence with overflow where Geo starts evicting last recently used values from memory. This way, you can store a lot more data in each node without having lots of RAM. If you have fast flash storage, this actually works fairly well for certain applications. The most accessed values always stay in RAM, so the disk latency is only incurred on reads of evicted values that haven't been accessed for a while. Using eviction is not the fastest solution, though, as it does incur higher latency reads from disk, but is the cheapest solution out of any. One interesting thing we found while initially testing overflow was that it was unbelievably fast, just a tiny bit slower than not overflowing any data at all. So it turned out that because we had lots of free RAM on the large test machines, the operating system was using all of the free memory as file system cache. So all of the overflow data was actually being written to and read from RAM. What we essentially got was off heap in memory value store that was managed by the operating system. The next option is geodes off heap storage, which utilizes a large amount of raw memory that garbage collection does not see. Geode manages the memory blocks itself to store the values where they do not affect garbage collections. Unfortunately, I have not had a chance to test this one out, uh, but uh, Gideon advises that uh, performance would be pretty similar to uh, LRU overflow with file cache. So who here has uh, experience with GC tuning? And uh, how many of you enjoy doing it? <laughs> all right, the problem with all of the choices we talked about so far is that the large number of keys still require somewhat larger heaps, even if the values are not on the heap. Transient objects could also, could also cause lots of churn, triggering young GCs that hurt latencies. The solution that we actually implemented was to run geode with large heaps on GVMs with pauseless garbage collector. The only available option right now is Azul Zing. Uh, the best thing about it is that it doesn't require any GC tuning other than giving it as much memory as possible. 
Uh, it will be interesting to see how Oracle's new uh, Z garbage collection collector performs uh, for our use case, but it's not yet uh, quite mature for production. Although it's not pauseless, uh, it is specifically designed for large data sets. Right. In conclusion, after scaling vertically and horizontally and implement implementing garbage collection solution, we were able to grow the clusters to 40 terabytes without sacrificing latency uh, by using the pauseless garbage collector. So now that we've figured out how to store, the, store many terabytes of data in the cluster, we start using it more and more and hit another bottleneck. This time it's on the client side. We have way too much data for the client to effectively pull it over the network and process in series. It takes up significant CPU to deserialize many entries at high TPS. For intensive data processing, we can actually offload the logic by utilizing the free CPU on the geode cluster itself. So how do we parallelize the logic and reduce the network load? Well, when you have many large, um, large values needed for a single transaction, the best thing is to distribute the logic on the cluster. Pulling lots of data to the client for processing is way too slow. So the solution is to do the opposite. We execute the logic where the data lives using distributed functions. This has several benefits. It parallelizes execution, reduces load on the clients, and minimizes network utilization. Let's take a look how that works. So Geo's function execution service uh, lets you pass in arguments, execute code, and return results from geode servers. In many ways, this is analogous to stored procedures in a traditional relational database. The function execution service provides several invocation pattern options. You can execute a function on all servers, on specific servers, or most usefully, on specific data sets or application data partitions. We also refer to this as data-aware business logic execution. The data aware invocation pattern is accessed via the on region invocation API. The left hand diagram here um, shows the flow of a function execution on an entire partition data set. And in this case, the function is distributed and executed on all servers. The right hand diagram, diagram shows the flow of function execution on a specific filtered subset of, partition, of a partition data set. And this limits execution to just the subset of servers that are filtered, that match the filter. So Geo, Geode machinery provides an important data context for developers to code functions against. We can see the basic code here. For an on-region function invocation, the higher level function context can be cast to a data specific region function context that matches the target filter set. The context specific filter objects are also accessible via get filter method which excludes all filters that were routed to other servers. Importantly, this allows filter objects to be implemented as context-specific arguments to the function. Note that the, the, uh, the with args method that comes with the service actually only provides a way to enter global arguments that would be provided everywhere. So subsequently, custom user code can access the local data more efficiently and if you implement optimize for write on your function to be true, then all write operations are also optimized and require to wait for only a single network round trip for uh, HA replication. So if you're using, um, if you're updating multiple entries with the same arguments, you could use function arguments. But if you need to update them with different values, using arguments would be very inefficient as all arguments will be sent to each affected node. Each node 
will have to ignore most of the arguments because they do not apply on, uh, to its local data. This is very inefficient for the whole platform. Although it's not obvious from geoed APIs, we can solve this by sending the requests um, in the filter. You can implement partition resolver on the request filter object and return the key. The set of these context specific requests can then be passed in the key set uh, as the key set in the filter. Let's take a look at a code example. Uh, this is client side code. Our request contains a key and a delta. For simplicity, the delta here is just an integer. The delta logic uh, is in the function that we'll take a look uh, next. So we add a filter to the execution before calling the function. The trick here is that instead of the keys, the filter contains requests. The function <coughs> call will be sent only to the nodes that have the entries for the specified requests. In addition, only the requests that need to go to the specific nodes will be sent. This wouldn't work using simple arguments as they're global. The function is then called by name uh, for fastest execution since it's already deployed on the cluster. Let's take a look at the update request uh, to see how the filter works. So this is a generic update request that can hold any type of key and uh, update object to apply to the corresponding value. It implements partition resolver to tell geode where to route the function calls. In this case, we want the request to be routed by key. Let's take a look uh, at the function itself. Uh, this function will be executed concurrently on multiple nodes. Geode function interface provides function context with arguments and the data aware filter. In our implementation, the filter contains the request specific to the node that the function is executing on. We iterate through the set of requests and process each one. More on that in a minute. Then we send the result back to the client. So the function we just looked at distributes compute on the cluster, but we also need to update data in real time so the next transaction has immediate access to the latest data. We need to make decisions with completely up-to-date values, which means if two transactions that approach uh, an authorization limit come in at the same time, one needs to be approved and another declined. We have to ha handle concurrency for this to work. The function code is pretty simple, but the logic of processing each request is what actually allows concurrent delta requests from numerous clients. We have to briefly lock the key to be able to apply the deltas without collisions. Unfortunately, we cannot use optimistic concurrency because the redundant puts take a relatively long time. Within the lock, we do a get, modify, and a put. Even though the logic is different when the value is not found, it still completes the operations on an entry within the lock. After the lock is released, we can run more compute and generate a response to send to the client. Uh, just a note here, each thread should only lock a single key at a time to prevent deadlocks. So we just used distributed function to enable parallel updates. We sent request in filter to minimize the load and locked each key while applying the updates. But there's still a problem. The redundant put inside the lock takes a relatively long time due to network I.O. if the value is large. We have to implement delta propagation to pass the change along to the redundant copy to avoid sending the entire value. So um, a quick primer on Geo's delta API. 
So I mentioned earlier that reducing the overall heap memory object count provides some real GC pause time benefits. It's easier to scale the overall memory if the working data set is coalesced or grouped into larger objects, um, and thus a smaller number of them. However, the larger an entry value object, the more expensive an update operation becomes. And if small items in the group data are updated frequently, then most of the network and disk I.O. resulting from persistence in HA replication may be wasted. To prevent this problem, Geode offers the Delta API. This allows developers to reduce the on-the-wire update size to only include what's changed. And the efficiency benefits increase as the size of the overall entry value object increases. In some ways, this is like a SQL update um, that only modifies specific columns and only for a, a single primary key record. It also optionally reduces memory churn by applying the delta directly and leaving it unchanged. Uh, leaving the unchanged data as is. Although to do this, you have to be careful about managing concurrent reads and updates since the value isn't isolated by making a copy first. Hmm. The main trade-off with deltas is that the developer is responsible for implementing the logic to track, serialize, deserialize, and apply changes. Let's look at how the DMP system implements Geode's Delta API. Hmm. Here's an example of processing a single request with delta propagation. Instead of applying the delta directly to the value, we now, apply, we now call apply delta on the delta value object wrapper. When the value doesn't exist, we initialize a new one. Otherwise, we call apply delta, specifying that we want to propagate the delta to the redundant copy. Here's that uh, delta value object. For simplicity, the obvious methods are not shown. So to implement the value that supports delta propagation, we add a delta object. We implement delta interface with three methods. Has delta just tells Geo that the, data, the delta exists. Uh, we return true if the delta is not null. To delta, method serializes the delta to send to the redundant node. And from delta, deserializes and applies the delta to the object. Our apply delta method has an option to set uh, the delta in the value object so it will be replicated to the redundant copy. Rewinding a bit, here are some of the results of filtered requests and delta propagation. For our use case, implementing context-aware arguments resulted in a 95% reduction in network traffic between clients and server nodes, along with 50% latency reduction and 40% reduction, uh, CPU reduction on the geode servers. Delta propagation resulted in an additional 50% reduction in peer-to-peer -peer network traffic and helped latencies by eliminating the need to send large objects over the network. So here's a bit as uh, a visualization of what uh, we went over, um, focusing on delta updates from several, several clients to a single entry. Since we have to lock the key to update uh, the entry, the client uh, call waits to acquire the lock before each del uh, its delta can be applied. Although we do the separation on the server, the lock does take some time as delta propagation has to go through the network until the put completes. This significantly limits the throughput of delta updates. To be able to sustain highest possible throughput, we would have to risk losing some data consistency to gain update availability. Uh, back to Gideon for a lesson in uh, CAP theorem. Not a big lesson. <laughs> um, so let's recall the, the basics of the CAP theorem, right? which states that we must choose any two of consistency of data, availability of data, and partition tolerance, or, or being able to survive a, uh, a network partition event um, 
and, uh, and keep the other, uh, um, and still be available to the system. So geodes partitioning, uh, redundant partition regions implement CP, right? Consistency and partition tolerance. And so we're prioritizing consistency and protection from network partition events. Um, so yeah, PRs with redundancy are always CP, but there is more flexibility with other data region options. For example, replicated regions may loosen consistency with asynchronous acknowledgements using the DNOAC uh, distribution scope. For ultimate flexibility, Geode has the option for local distribution scope regions. But this also means more developer responsibility, since now there's no automatic distribution of events, of updates. Um, MasterCard's decision management system uh, platform leverages this capability to help implement special support for highly contentious updates for short periods of time. So although delta propagation makes the updates for the large values much faster, we still could not support the desired update rates to single entries. Delta propagation can only be optimized so much until the bottleneck becomes the replication latency between the nodes. So strong consistency is no longer your friend here. So we need to work around the synchronous redundancy. The solution is to temporarily suspend replication on entries that are updated at high rates. You could do this by tracking the update rates for each entry. When a high rate is detected, we put the entry into a local region on the same node that has no replication, no partitioning, and no redundancy, and uh, no persistence. You then have a timer task that takes updated entries and puts them into a, a, the partition region at a predefined interval. This task also removes local entries that have been idle for some time and are no longer hot. Here's an illustration of delayed redundancy. This greatly reduces network traffic as we only replicate the entries at a scheduled interval of one second. All of the delta updates happen entirely in memory without incurring any network bottlenecks. If a node fails, we will miss up to a second of updates, but consistency is always retained on the partitioned region. For this use case, the risk of missing a small fraction of updates is acceptable to be able to support extreme throughput. So in conclusion, we have cheated synchronous replication by applying deltas in the local region and flushing to a partitioned region at a scheduled interval. We went from being able to support under 1,000 updates per entry to supporting extreme concurrent update rates to over 100,000 per second. In summary, Today we talked about the challenges of fast big data and design patterns to keep ahead of the rapid growth. We explored the different ways that large amount of data can be stored on geode clusters. We learned an efficient way to distribute the data using collocation and how to run compute on the data using distributed functions. We optimized how the data is updated and replicated using delta propagation and utilized delayed replication to enable extreme concurrency. So we hope uh, everyone learned that working with real-time data doesn't stop at uh, just standing up an in-memory in data grid, but continues in many directions to ensure stability, performance, and scalability. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Do, are you able to say uh, an example of the of an entity in, in your business that that uh, that might be that that hot point that you have to, to flip to the, the lower uh, lower consistency of, of service? What 
what, what do things converge on? What do updates converge on that uh, are you able to say? Uh, yes, um, I, I do have a few examples. Um, for example, it could be a home shopping network. Um, so a single merchant uh, submitting uh, all of their authorizations nightly uh, in, a, in a batch with many different uh, threads. But we actually keep, uh, uh, keep aggregates on, um, on that volume. Um, another one could be a... Um, uh, vacation booking a company submitting authorizations for or submitting um, buying the buying all the tickets with one card number uh, also in batch um, and also and also higher level aggregates um, such as merchant level like big merchants uh, like Amazon or uh, region level aggregates would uh, incur also this uh, pattern. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah, so your calculations for, I think it was number of buttons, uh, you said you had to go to the next prime number. And I'm just wondering why, can you explain why that's so, the difference? So the question is uh, why, um, why do we need to use, use a prime number for a number of buckets? Um, so, uh, that's um, in the example there uh, we had if you have um, an integer or a long as, as your key um, or any any number and uh, say uh, your your key is being incremented by by two um, and then um, so all of your keys are going to end up in uh, in even buckets uh, for for that cluster like if your keys are generated uh, with a sequence that uh, gets incremented by two in a database, for example. So then uh, half of your buckets are not going to have any data. Uh, there are some other, um, other reasons uh, that probably won't go into here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my math is probably not strong enough, but um, <laughs> the uh, prime number gives you the most even distribution. That's what I've always learned. <laughs> Can you give us the idea about your cluster configuration? Because this is all about, like, I mean, in memory bit. Um, but, like, when the transactions are coming in, right? I mean, you are in into the kite card business. So, what does the cluster configuration look like? And what that kind of data type is? Because serialization, deserialization also has an impact. Yes. If you're using just JSON or you're using something else. We're using PDX. Uh, so, uh, that's uh, Geodes. Um, uh, Geo's built-in API that's uh, very efficient uh, in um, in size and also the um, uh, the speed of, of serialization is pretty good. Um, it externalizes all the metadata to an, uh, to a separate data store uh, so that your uh, serialized uh, byte array is uh, the smallest possible. In terms of your cluster configuration, how does it look like? Okay, for our cluster configuration. Um, we have uh, we have uh, 70 node clusters right now, um, and uh, each uh, each node is a 600 gigabyte heap. Yes. Uh, when you're doing a uh, deployment, say for a code change, what do you do? Do you update the artifacts uh, on the existing node, or do you have to tear uh, an existing node down? To Uh, right now, we shut down the nodes um, to do that. Uh, there, there are ways to do live deployments um, that uh, well, we have not uh, done much of. Um, you could do like a rolling update uh, of code. Um, so shutting down one node at a time and your cluster stays up. Um, probably a good idea to do that with uh, with low tra at low tra traffic times. Um. But your data is, is uh, replicated, so you don't have to worry about losing Right, right. Uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have replication, and we have also asynchronous persistence. So even though we can shut down the entire cluster, um, and 
after routing traffic somewhere else, and then bring it back up if needed. And for the GC profiling, did you use any tools? It's a complex process, right? Uh, the, the simplest thing uh, for GC profiling uh, is to enable um, GC logging, and then you see all the pauses. Um, Gemfire also keeps track of the, or Geode and Gemfire keeps track of the uh, GC pauses uh, in its statistics. Um, so you, you can see uh, you can see those. Uh, so it doesn't really require any specialized tooling. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, it, it really depends on your data set. Uh, we do have, uh, obviously, entries that are bigger than, than others, um, but we don't store individual transactions. They're all, uh, they're all aggregates, uh, but uh, it is a possibility. Now, if you have billions of entries, uh, it pretty much evens out anyway. Um, Scale helps. Yes. Are there scenarios where you have to warm up the cache somewhat? Uh, so we, um, I guess we don't quite use it as a cache. Uh, it is um, a primary source of truth for, for a lot of things. Not the primary, but it, it, uh, some of the data gets loaded uh, in the batch process, and some of the data gets generated from the transactions itself during real-time processing. So uh, there's no, no warm-up for, for our system. But at a system restart, it's pulling all the data from the, from the geo disk stores. And uh, you can configure it to, um, to pull uh, to populate the values uh, immediately at startup uh, in um, in RAM or lazily load it from uh, from disk afterwards uh, while it starts up. I think you can configure it not to load it at all from disk, so then it will uh, read it from disk as needed. Yeah, just to double check, were you talking about things like? Um Warm up of the JIT compiler, that sort of warm up, or just hydrating the data? More like a down and an up scenario. Okay. Then. All right. Any others? All right. Well, uh, we'll be around for a while if anyone wants to chat. I can talk a little more about your question, too. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>